I was a person who wanted to win. <laughs> I might have won sometimes and not others, but that was something I was interested in. But I also had a really like a scientist brain and wanted to understand, yes, but how does one reliably go achieve at these things? Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we bring you eye-opening insights from the most impactful leaders in business and our communities. Today, we've got someone special, Carla Fowler, MD, PhD, Managing Director at Thaxa Executive Coaching, a performance science expert who helps executives reach their highest potential. Carla, we're excited to have you here today. Thanks so much, Jason. I'm excited to have this conversation. Definitely. And for everyone watching, hit like, comment, and share so we can bring these game-changing ideas to as many people as possible. And don't forget to subscribe. You won't want to miss any of our upcoming conversations with trailblazing leaders like Carla. So, elephant in the room, what's behind the name Thaxa? And how does a name like that define your approach to coaching high-performance leaders? Oh, great question. Uh, so, Thaxa, when, it, when I started my practice 11 years ago, uh, Thaxa came to mind as a choice for the name, and it was inspired by, I think, my earliest approach. You could say this was my earliest performance principle in my life, <laughs> and that is the idea that whenever you're trying to do something really big that or something ambitious, challenging, that you don't go and do it all at once, that it's always broken down into a set of like the right steps, maybe something you practice or do and compound over time. It may be, uh, you know, linking up a couple of different things. So this is something that was the earliest thing that I knew about how one goes about doing something at a high level. And so uh, the word thaxa in Latin means a task. And so to me, you know, big ambitious goals are actually just a series of the right tasks lined up, done consistently. And so that is where the name comes from. And, you know, philosophically, when I think about coaching and how to help people as they are trying to do ambitious things, I think there's a lot of it that is about helping them break things down. Uh, sometimes that's identifying what are the things that they're going to have to do over and over again very consistently. So for example, like in sales, one of the things you're going to have to do, whether you're um, trying to raise money from investors or you're actually trying to go out and like sell your product is uh, you're going to have to make a lot of those calls. Um, but I sometimes it's not doing a lot of one thing and, and the task doesn't um, come from that piece. Sometimes it's saying, hey, we need to break this challenging goal down into the different elements that will help you perform at a high level. And so as I think about coaching people using performance science, um, which is sort of the basis philosophically for the work that I do, um, I like to approach performance from a couple of the different angles. And um, so that's like another way we break things down into different tasks. So Thax is the name of my firm, and it really, as you pointed out, like has these different links to how I think about coaching and how I think about performance. Yes, and you definitely know about breaking things down and doing them over and over and over again because you pursued an MD and a PhD at the same time, a path most people wouldn't even attempt. So what drove you to tackle that challenge? Hmm. So looking back, I, ha I have to go back a little bit, a couple decades now, there were a few things that definitely influenced that. Um, one of the first things is actually just that I, throughout my life, have enjoyed going after challenging arenas, like trying to find whether it was a sport that I could play or a professional um, or scholastic uh, you know, degree or program to pursue. Um, one of the things I figured out pretty early was that even though it was very uncomfortable to put yourself in challenging situations, that one of the things I personally got from it was it helped me build my sense of confidence. So even if you had to struggle, even if it was painful or uncomfortable, that getting through the experience actually helped me feel much more capable and confident as I then had to 
go on and do whatever came next. So one, one thing that definitely influenced it was uh, just, it was a challenging path, but it was a defined path. Um, I think a second piece of it was that I've always been really interested in doing something that would help human beings where like the connection was pretty direct and clear. And so I was definitely a, a math and science oriented thinker. And when you sort of combine that with how could you really work with people and feel like you were impacting them, um, medicine seemed like a very good choice. And so I think that was another piece that influenced choosing that pathway. And, uh, you know, a third piece may have been that I loved how it was interdisciplinary. So the idea that as a doctor, you might both need to study medicine so you could understand what happens when people get sick, how do you help them, but that simultaneously it might be really important to be studying, well, how do these illnesses work or how do treatments work? Um, what is the biology behind them? And to really understand some of the, the background of it, I just thought that made sense in combo to not just understand one point of view. And I think if you actually trace this forward now, as I am working on performance science, which is really different than the practice of medicine, I still love it because performance science is actually the combination of a lot of different disciplines. So you definitely have contributions from like the business schools and people who are thinking about strategy, but you also have contributions from like the physiologists, like how do our bodies react to stress and how, how does stress even impact our minds? Uh, we also have contributions um, from the psychologists that are thinking about mindset, right? And how that influences motivation and confidence. Uh, and then fourthly, um, you know, if you think about the whole field of productivity and uh, even execution and things like Lean Six Sigma, right? All contributing to how do we execute things effectively and efficiently? So um, even now that theme of, of like wanting to study things from multiple viewpoints that are interdisciplinary really appeals to me. And I think I see the power of it. So those are, there were a number of things that influenced me to take that pathway, but I think those are some of the things that come to mind. Well, I think everybody watching or listening sees the power in what you're talking about. We're all excited to hear more about it. But first, where did your obsession with performance science begin and how did it evolve into helping leaders excel at the highest level? Mm. We probably have to go back pretty far <laughs> to answer that question. We, we've got time. All right. Well, um, honestly, the first time I can really remember having a thought that was about performance as almost like a, like a meta concept was in fifth grade. <laughs> and in this case, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the presidential physical fitness test. It's, it's called something. I remember. Now. I don't know. Okay. You remember. So it was a series of challenges you had to do in fourth and fifth grade and everything from a hundred meter sprint to, um, pull-ups and, uh, like it did str like straight leg reach. And anyways, I really wanted to like achieve, achieve the mark and, I was really struggling with the shuttle run <laughs> and which is where you just have to run back and forth between two lines and like pick up a beanbag and drop it off and then go back to the other line, get another beanbag, drop it off. And you had to hit a certain time. So I remember it didn't come naturally to me. So I wasn't hitting the time. And I actually went up to the elementary school by myself. My parents didn't tell me to do this. And I set up some pine cones and I just started practicing. And it was the first time that I, that I thought, all right, there's this thing. I don't know how to do it. I think I can figure it out, but I need to just, it's not going to come naturally. So I have to like tinker with it. I need to run experiments to figure out how it is that you change directions in the most efficient way. So it wasn't like I had a, a coach or anything up there with me. I just was like, I think I can figure this out. And, um, so there, there are moments like that. And my family um, did a lot of backpacking growing up. And in middle school, I had a teacher who had us do all sorts of like really challenging physical um, type uh, challenges, for lack of a better word. Um, 
like things like walking 50 miles in 24 hours. I mean, this was a really amazing teacher and a really outstanding outdoor fitness class. But sprinkled throughout my growing up were some physical challenges that made me think a lot about um, how is it that one develops that physical grit or toughness? How do you manage yourself mentally when you are uncomfortable? And in this case, it was like very much physical discomfort. Uh, you know, how do you keep going after something when um, you still have a lot to go and you're tired, right? And so to me, these were all questions that had to do with performance. And I was, I think, equally as interested in actually achieving the performance, so meeting the mark or finishing the race or whatever it was. But I was also interested in how do other people do this? What are techniques other people are using to be successful at this thing? And, um, and so I think that is where that interest started, both in wanting to have the accomplishment for myself. You know, if there was a track meet, I'll, I'll be honest, like I was a person who wanted to win. <laughs> I might have won sometimes and not others, but that was something I was interested in. But I also had a really like a scientist brain and wanted to understand, yes, but how does one reliably go achieve at these things? Um, not just sort of hope and pray or um, think that what one sort of naturally has as talent and what you show up with on that day will be enough. And so how is it that you actually enhance some of that? And so I think it, if you go on from there, certainly there were other challenging arenas I went in, but it was always with that mindset of looking around and both trying to understand what were the techniques that worked for me, but also what were the techniques other people were using to be successful? And could one make some thematic uh, like takeaways from those? So before we get into the techniques, what makes some people take on the seemingly impossible and what's your secret to keeping them focused when the going gets tough? Mm. Well, I think that people take on challenging things for a number of different reasons. And so there's not, there's not just one and some of them I resonate with, uh, so I can speak for myself, but I also in coaching people. I'm always asking like, yeah, what motivates you to do this thing? Why are you interested in it? So I think for some people, um, when they're taking on something challenging, it has a lot of purpose. So for example, um, like if I'm working with a nonprofit director who has a really mission oriented organization, uh, they're making an impact and for them, they feel a great sense of purpose in what is their contribution? right? How are they making the world better or making something better for some piece of the community? Um, so I think purpose is one reason people do it. I think another reason um, that's very natural and human is actually for the status of it. And I, I don't view status um, or status seeking a, as a negative thing. Certainly it can be overdone and we'll see this happen, but as human beings, I think we want to be recognized we want to be seen as capable or um, in having achieved something really difficult. So I think, you know, when you do something challenging and you do it successfully, we often get some status from our communities or our workplaces. Uh, I think a third reason is one of the things that I brought up, which is sometimes we need to take on a challenge <clears throat> to show ourselves that we can, that it helps us build confidence in ourselves. And then I think sometimes people take on a challenge because they have to, right? Like some, sometimes the challenge is like thrust upon us and we didn't choose it, but it is what's in front of us. And so um, what we have is to accept it and then to decide, you know, how we want to go forward with that. So uh, I think those are some of the things I think about uh, in terms of why do people do challenging things that are hard and uncomfortable? <laughs> um, you know, in terms of like, what is the secret to that? Uh, I, I am always the first person to say there is not, there isn't a secret hack, but I do think performance science helps us start to break down how to go about being successful at something challenging uh, so that we're not left with, again, like a hope and praise strategy or, um, and I think it helps us actually be really deliberate 
about what processes we're going to run versus just either trying to outwork the problem and only using effort as our only tool. Um, and I think it helps us uh, break down what are the different parts of doing the work that we will need to think about. So for example, um, I, when I break down performance science, I often think of it in four big buckets. It used to be three, it is now four, um, just with growing data that I see accumulating. But uh, we can think about performance from the standpoint of what is our strategy. So like of all the things we might do to approach a challenging goal, what are some of the most important levers that give us the best impact? That's like our strategy bucket. Um, I think we have the other bucket, which is um, if we've identified what we need to do, can we figure out the most efficient or effective ways to do that? That's like our execution bucket. We have a mindset bucket, and that is really about how am I going to stay like stay in it for the long haul, right? When the going gets tough, how am I going to feel confident? Um, how am I going to help others around me feel confident if it's a team effort? Um, how am I going to deal with the uncertainty? So that's our third bucket. And then the fourth bucket is actually the physiology bucket. And that's that when we're doing something challenging where there is stress, one of the things we actually have to do is manage our biology. So that could be making sure that we have adequate recovery time and sleep. Um, it also could be that we need ways to calm ourselves down when we are in the thick of something that's like really intense or stressful. So again, lots of great tools in that bucket as well. But um, I think one of the secrets to um, really trying to take on challenging things is to break them down and ask yourself, can I, can I think through these different areas and what will be necessary for me to do to give myself the greatest chance of success at what I'm aiming at? Yeah, and those are the four key principles of performance science that you use to help people tackle enormous challenges. And those, that's some really good advice on how they can start applying that every day. So if you're someone who has had greatness thrust upon you recently and you're trying to figure out how you're going to meet that challenge, rewind a little bit and listen to what, what she just said about those things because those are really, really important. Now, you work with elite leaders. What's the one habit that sets them apart from the pack? Hmm. Everyone is different <laughs> in the sense of uh, great, great elite leaders don't all look the same. But there are some things that I find are more common. And uh, one of those things is they tend to have uh, a a cultivated or natural, but um, they work to focus. And so one of the things that they are doing that I think is difficult to do, but that benefits all of us when we can do it is they are actually not trying to do it all. And so rather than, I, I'm not saying they don't work incredibly hard, but what they understand is that if they can actually both work incredibly hard, but also focus that energy, not on trying to do everything, but on uh, focus that work towards the things that are the most potent or impactful towards what they're trying to do, that they will actually go farther than other people. And so I think this, this focus matters both for like where they're spending their time, but it also matters to how well they can communicate with their teams and help their teams win. So one of the pieces about focus is both um, knowing clearly what you're aiming at also understanding what's most important to get there. And then if you actually have clarity about that as a leader, you have a much better ability to communicate to your team. And when your team understands that, they have a couple of things. Number one, uh, they're more able to align their abilities and, and their contributions with your priorities, right? The things that um, you think are going to have the greatest impact. But also... It's really motivating as a team when you actually know like what you want to be doing and that you know your contribution matters and you can see where you specifically feed into a particular priority, like where you see your impact. And so one of the interesting things about focus for leaders is that it both uh, helps teams um, be more potent, but I think it also helps team motivation 
because there's nothing more unmotivating than feeling like you're working really hard, but you don't know if your contribution matters. And if you're not even really sure, like, are we headed in the right direction? <laughs> so um, that's the surprising thing about focus is that it both certainly helps with your impact, but it also connects to that other bucket of mindset and motivation. And um, so that's one of the things I see leaders doing um, that tend to make them very effective is that, that first thing around focus. What are some other strategies we can adopt for pushing ourselves to the next level and how, especially as leaders, can we motivate our team members who might be stuck in their comfort zone? Mm. So, um, lots, there are lots of different strategies and, and we can talk through some of the ones that I find I, that I work with people commonly on. Um, that are helpful. So to answer the first part of your question, there are a few things that often come up when we're, when I'm working with people and um, that sort of punch above their weight and really help. So um, one of them is actually taking time to plan. <laughs> uh, I know it's difficult. I mean, I have had to-do lists that are a mile long. It is very difficult to stop doing things in order to actually take some time to think and plan. But one of the things that really punches above its weight is actually giving yourself an hour a week, maybe more than that, but to look at what's coming, what are the deadlines, what are the things that uh, you're responsible for, and even looking a few weeks in advance and starting to actually be really deliberate and intentional about what you're blocking time for on your calendar, what is realistic, who do you need to set up for success? Um, you know, who do you need to be talking to? That actually taking that time both will make you more effective, but the other surprising secondary effect, not unlike focus, is that when leaders take time to plan, they have a much better ability to work with their team and set their team up for success. But also, um, it's a way of slowing down time for yourself as a leader that often one of the challenges leaders face is that um, there may be a number of things they don't have control over and they can feel like they're just in reaction mode, like constantly moving very quickly to try and keep up with things. And the only way we can start to get out of that, even though there will always be things we don't control, is actually to start to be more deliberate with what, like, what will we do? What is there time to do? And actually starting to plan and schedule that. And that when we're deliberate, even though things will still sometimes not go to plan, there will be unexpected things that come up. Our ability to deal with those things is much better. So it actually tends to create a better sense of well-being for leaders, even if they are having to react sometimes still. So that's a technique I think is uh, often um, underutilized, but very helpful. And I find myself recommending it to many clients that I work with. Um, yeah, if you uh, have been watching this show for a while, you've heard me say it over and over again. General Eisenhower, later President Eisenhower said, plans are useless. Planning is indispensable. And if you're looking to build up your own resilience and build up your team's resilience, getting them involved in planning, doing the planning, even if you end up throwing out the plan, is a great way to build that resilience. Now, you know as well as anyone entrepreneurship is a wild ride. So what's your top advice for startup founders or entrepreneurs who are feeling a little overwhelmed by the twists and turns of that? My advice would be that there are generally only a few things that are like very big drivers on that ride. <laughs> and often when you are feeling overwhelmed, one of the best things you can do is come back to what those drivers are and build a process for yourself to focus on it. So let me give an example. Um, often as a startup founder, you are dealing with a series of funnels. You probably have a sales funnel, but you probably also have like an investor funnel, right? Where like you're, you're raising money, but you're also trying to get traction for whatever is your product or your service, right? And so an example might be that we are almost always served by going after one or both of those funnels. And so 
when you're feeling overwhelmed, sometimes that's because you're trying to do a lot of things and you're not really seeing the impact of it. So you're working really hard, but not getting an ROI. And so that's when really focusing and directing that energy, I think can be very helpful. And I'm not saying that is easy, like making, you know, doing sales efforts, reaching out to investors to have those conversations are, those are all conversations where you're going to hear no, probably more than you're going to hear yes. And yet if you can take it upon yourself to make the lists, who is going in the top of that funnel? Who could you talk to um, and reach out to? Even if you're not going to ask them for a sale or for an investment, like who could you convince to be on your mission with you who might introduce you to the next person and just get on the phone, get out there. And while it is difficult, what I have found is it's probably the one thing that's going to make you feel better and feel more in control is if you actually say, I have to lean into that challenge because at least those challenges are the ones that are going to move the needle for me. And so that would be my advice is pick one of your most important funnels and go after it. Absolutely. So speaking of leaning into challenges, medical school is really intense. What leadership lesson from your time as a medical student and a resident do you apply in your business today? Oh, that is an interesting question. Um, I do have memories from medical school. <laughs> I didn't sleep very much. Um, you know, some of my memories about leadership, when, when you get into medicine, whether, whether as a med student in the hospital or um, once you become a resident, I, I think one of the things I learned was that what works for you as an individual contributor, like, will not probably work as well um, once you become a leader. And so there are some shifts you just have to go through. So my best example of this would be that um, when I was studying for medical school, at some point when it was just classwork, I realized that I could study way more efficiently from the syllabus. And so I stopped going to class. Uh, I, I went to some classes, but I actually had a limited amount of time. I, I think the statute of limitations is up on that. So you're probably okay. Oh God, I hope so. I, I passed all my tests. <laughs> um, I stopped going to class and I studied and I passed the tests. But um, one of the interesting things is that my ideas about how to organize time and what would work once I got into the clinic. So once I was a resident and I had med students, that wasn't going to work. I couldn't go hole up in an office and just like do all the work. They were sort of my team, the med students, and they could help me. They were limited in what they could do. They couldn't do everything a resident as an MD could do. But um, I don't feel like I was uh, very good at utilizing my team because I hadn't fully made that switch from like individual contributor to how do you set up a team for success? And one of the lesson of this for me was that, um, number one, as a leader, you could almost always, well, not always, but often you could do the job of someone on your team better than they can at where they are in their career path, right? Like you've done their job before and you know how to do it in and out and you could probably do it faster. But the whole point of having a team and having you lead the team is that the scale of your efforts can be dramatically larger, but only if you're willing to let your team member do the job. And they might make some mistakes, you might need to coach them, but the scale of what you can all accomplish together is way bigger than if you're trying to do everyone's job. And so this is sort of one of the leadership lessons is when we think about impact, we have to get away from, well, how perfect is this person's work or this person's work? Or like, how perfectly can we do things? And we have to look at the impact as a whole. How good can the whole team be together? And what does that mean I need to be doing as a leader versus like trying to do everyone's jobs? Outstanding. Well, the debate is raging, especially where you are right now and in Silicon Valley and in, in tech all around the world. Return to office or stay remote. What does performance science Tell us about making the right call for our teams. Mm. This feels like a very political topic. So I'll, 
Here's what I'll say. There are absolutely benefits to working remotely and there are benefits to being in the office. And so we're going to experience trade-offs either way. But what I would say seems to be less, um, less noticed or less recognized is that um, one of the things we are really missing out on when we are working remotely, um, when, we're, when we work as a part of a group, but we're actually remote, we're not all together, um, is that uh, we're actually missing out on a lot of visibility, both with each other, like with our, each other's peers, as well as with people who are above us, like in our corporate structure. And I bring this up because uh, in performance science, certainly one of the things we can measure is what are our results, right? Like what, what is the quality of a person's work? And that is one piece of performance. But for us to be successful, we actually need to not only be producing good results, we also have to have those results be visible. And one of the things that has gone away with remote work is the ability for us to have FaceTime with, for example, our boss or a skip level, um, or for people to just get that passive exposure to who we are, what we're working on that just takes place in an office. And that is something that is hard to see the cost of. Um, it's just the absence of something, but um, it, it's something that we don't get as much of when, when our work is we are online in a meeting or we are not you know, or we're separate, we're just working individually. And there's no sort of hybrid time in between where we might be sort of together, but not, not actively in a meeting. And, um, and we miss out on that. And all of this, you know, to say, I understand that there were many people who gained like two hours a day back from a commute by going remote. So it's hard to weigh these things against each other with like, to, how, how do you make a value judgment about what's more important, saving two hours a day, you know, on your commute or, um, having some of that face time. These are really hard things to make a value judgment on. And of course, given the number of people, um, who have a stake in the game, it makes sense that it's a big argument. Um, and it makes sense that it's controversial. Well, I think if, uh, if more leaders and more employees took into account the things you were saying and thought about the conversation the way you're framing it, this might be a little bit easier conversation to have, and there might not be so much controversy over it. <clears throat> so let's take a break from the, the serious questions. Let's play a game. This game is called Rapid Response. So what I want you to do is I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And I just want you to come up with the first thing that comes to your mind. So it doesn't need to be a short one-word answer. Just looking for the first thing that comes to your mind. Take as long as you want to, to answer the question. We're not in any rush. But I just want to get the first thing that pops into your mind. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. All right. Carla Fowler, rapid response round. Your time begins now. Podcast recommendation. Mm, Peter Atia, The Drive. A performance metric we should all track. Hours of sleep. Ah, good one. Not one most people think of. Someone we should all be watching or paying attention to. That's a, that's a hard one. I, I have lots of ideas about something we should all pay attention to, but it's not a person. The thing that came to mind to me I just re more recently is we should pay attention to how much we're breathing. Did you know that like we go, our brains are like, we stop breathing when we're looking at a computer that we actually like have computer apnea or like digital apnea. Anyways, I've been thinking that I should pay more attention to how much I breathe. <laughs> that is really uh, disturbing to me because I'm spending a lot of time looking at computers right now, so I'm definitely going to start nice. paying attention to my breathing a lot more. <laughs> All right. On this one, you get a choice. Don't answer yet. What is your go-to song to get pumped up or your walk-on music? I 
really, I like Tropical House quite a bit as a as like a musical genre. Um, but the song I would pick would be Kygo Freeze. Okay. Biggest influence in your life? I think my parents. Um, in the sense of they were my first large influence and there were just so many things that uh, how how they raised us that um, you know and like you have challenges too but I just think there were so many things that when I look back feel instrumental about who I am today and I like who I am today and and so I feel pretty grateful for that <laughs> fantastic a book everyone should read There are two that come to mind. Um, one of them is I really liked uh, 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals. I thought it was really great as a philis. It's not a productivity book. It is actually a book about time and sort of philosophically about time. That sounds fascinating. What's the second one? The second one is actually, it's called The Formula, and it references what, um, what I was talking about, where success is not just your, your performance results, but it's also how visible are those results when we were talking about the, the remote versus in-person work. Um, the author of this book is a social scientist who went to study success, and that's the scientist who really influenced how I was thinking about the importance of visibility so not just what are your results, but who knows about your results. And that that second piece has a lot to do with our success really influenced me. And I just know that for a lot of people, um, humble, wonderful people, not people who like to brag a lot or self-promote a lot, are producing great results, but aren't making other people aware of those results. And so I think it's a really important book because for many of us, we could do a better job of not bragging, but helping other people know how to get the best value out of us, helping know like what we're capable of producing. Excellent. Best thing about autumn. I really like the temperature, like the, the feel of the air when you're in a place that actually has kind of four seasons. Uh, I like, I like going outside in the morning and like feeling sort of that crispness. Very cool. Next vacation spot. Well, I, I think, I think this would qualify as a vacation. Um, I'm actually currently living and working in Portugal, but uh, I have a mini vacation over to uh, Switzerland to see some family and I won't be working. So that is a vacation. Sounds like a vacation to me. Yeah. <laughs> a, a trend to keep an eye on. I think uh, AI is the obvious answer that comes to mind. So it, it uh, is already in all of our workplaces and I know causing anxiety for some, um, creating loads of opportunities for other people. We're all learning how to use it in the most effective ways and both like getting better at it, making mistakes with it. And I think it is something that is coming. Uh, I mean, it's already here, whether we like it or not. And so I think it's just a, a trend to lean into and figure out how, how one uses it what is the utility in one's life? And that will look different for different people. Absolutely. We're going to dig into that a little deeper in a bit. Favorite sports team? I like live sporting events. So I don't have a favorite team, but what I've learned about myself is if I am at a live sporting event, if I am there in person, I, I love it. So whether it, I went to my first hockey game, uh, maybe a, about a year ago, and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> so my favorite sports team is the one playing live right in front of me. Well, that 
poses you a tough choice because there's a home and away team usually playing live. But let's assume you're going with the home team. Yeah, hockey's great. Um, Vegas has become a really big hockey town now that we have the Golden Knights. It's really exciting. So oh, thank, thank you for playing our game. It's always nice to get to know our guests uh, a little bit outside of the main questions. So thank you for being a good sport. So in a world full of volatility and uncertainty, how can leaders future-proof their teams for the challenges of the 21st century? When I think about volatility and how does one handle that, I, by its very, the premise of the question alone, it's, it's not something where you know the challenge you need to prepare for. I mean, we know some of the challenges that are coming. We can guess at some of them. But the whole point is there's stuff we can't even imagine that we might need to deal with. So when I think about that, my strategies are very much process strategies. So processes that you run over time that are going to help you adapt and be resilient. Um, and that's, that is what I recommend. So there are three things I think about, and I'll list all three, and then we can dig into as many of them as, as feels good. So the first strategy is that we need to, as leaders, spend more time thinking so we can spend less time reacting. Um, that's strategy number one. Uh, the second strategy is that volatility, part of what it makes it uncomfortable for us is the fact that it often reveals gaps in our learning, like what we know, right? So AI is coming. Most of us don't know anything about it. Um, maybe we know more now, right? So it is revealing a gap in our understanding. So the second strategy is really about owning our learning and understanding that you might be mid-career, we might be late career, but we need to have a system and a process to help ourselves and our teams learn new things and, and do new things, even potentially scrapping entirely how we used to do things in favor of a new way. So that's strategy number two is we need to own our learning process. And then the third strategy is that we have to use our biology to our advantage. And what this, what I mean when I say this is that in a world that is volatile, that has a lot of uncertainty, that is very stressful. It is stressful for our brains. It is stressful for our bodies and, um, our bodies, it turns out we're actually built to deal with stress and stress. It turns out is not actually bad for us, but how we think about stress makes a big difference on what its impact is on our bodies. And so there are great ways that we can actually help our teams like leverage their biology to manage the stress and also ramp down periodically when needed in order to be resilient over the long haul. So there are a number of techniques we can talk about there as well. So to recap, the three things are we need to protect time for ourselves to think. We need to own our learning and have some continuous learning over time. And we need to learn to use our biology to help us ride sort of the stress cycle and also ramp down periodically for our resilience. You mentioned a little while ago that AI, not only is AI coming, AI is here. We're using it now. It's starting to come into the workplace. How can we use what you just talked about, the strategies you just talked about, as AI and robots come in to become our coworkers, how can we prepare our teams for this radical shift in the workplace? Well, using some of, using some of these strategies, I, I think one of the first things we could say is it's worth spending some time thinking about like, well, where is like, where is AI going to impact us? That's a great question. Like if people were um, blocking some time to think, to actually think about that, you know, think about what you've already seen online. What do you already know? What have you heard from other people? What do you know about what's going on in your industry? And actually just start to map the different places and that it can be everything from sort of trivial stuff about using AI to help you write an email with a better tone right? Like, so for example, some people are blessed with very astute kind of emotional intelligence and know how to diplom diplomatically write a challenge email. Other people are not, but it turns out like 
AI can help you rewrite something in a number of different ways, right? So it could be something trivial like that, but it may also be that AI is going to fundamentally change some of the tools about how your business gets done. So again, spend some time thinking about that. That would be useful. Um, using the second topic to own your learning, um, it may be that you think about it and you're like, oh, I don't know very much. <laughs> um, or I know some, but I'm pretty sure I don't have the whole story. You could then say, great, what do I want to be learning about? And it turns out you can use ChatGPT to do some of your learning with you, right? Like, so you could ask it, hey, in X, Y, or Z industry, like what are the top 10 uses of AI um, in business operations? And then you could dig down on each of those and say, hey, will you give me a, you know, 500 word summary of like how this piece is being used um, or what are the most like rare or unique uses of it, right? So lots of different prompts. But the point is the second piece is go out and learn about it. Like learn what you don't know. You can phone a friend. Sometimes one hour call with someone in your network who is an expert at the technology or about AI who is willing to have lunch with you is a great place to start because they give you a framework where then when you go online and do some searches, you're much more oriented. Um, and then I think the third piece, this idea of like use our biology is like, there are some things that uh, AI might have tools for, but that we actually have to manage ourselves regardless. So um, that part is still saying, okay, like how, how do I make sure in the face of uncertainty that I have some tools in my life that help me like ramp down or help me, um, you know, get off, get off the computer <laughs> sometimes, right? Whether that's exercise or meditation or time with people, um, real people, <laughs> uh, not, not like a computer or the AI. Um, those are really important things for our biology. So, so those are, those are some thoughts I have about how, how to think through what's happening. And again, they're not prescriptive. I, I don't see the future any more than you do about how is AI going to impact these different industries, but we can engage in a process to help keep up with what's happening and be aware. And so I think that's the effort for us to do. Yeah. I think thinking it through is the, the best thing that uh, any leader can do with anything coming along and, and especially employees to think through how can they use that technology, no matter what the technology is, to fill the gaps of where they're not good at something. I think it's fantastic. I think it's great advice. So if you could gift every leader one skill instantly, what would it be and why does it matter so much? I think, I think it might be the skill of the pause. <laughs> Um, like the gift of being able to pause either for a short time or a longer time. But I think as leaders who often feel very responsible and are responsible for things going well, that it can become very easy to be reactive and just go, go, go always in motion, right? Like trying to wring the most out of every minute. And I think a pause, the absence of something is actually very useful. And I'll give two examples. The first example is like having good sort of emotional control and also um, a willingness to not react immediately as things are happening is an important leadership skill. Um, sometimes that's a pause to ask a question before answering, like before jumping in and saying something your team or to another person, pausing and asking a question, or even just pausing and saying like, let me think about that for a moment versus feeling like you have to like have the answer. So that's like a short pause. But I also think the willingness to pause and take some time to think is such an important skill set, And it's really hard to do as a leader. Sometimes it can feel like a luxury like, oh, I don't deserve this. Like my team is working so hard and there's so much work to do. Is it okay for me to sit and just think for an hour? But um, I think that time makes you a better leader 
it helps you see the future better. And even as you are reacting, because you will still have to react, uh, your brain is primed to do a better job. It is primed based on other thoughts you've had and time you've spent thinking. Even if you have to react kind of in a moment, your brain will be better prepared if you've given yourself time to pause and think. So I would say it is the power of the pause. Yeah, that was one of the hardest lessons I had to learn as an officer in the Air Force is sometimes you do need to just pause and let things play out and not get involved in things until the time is right. That's a that's fantastic that's fantastic advice for everyone. Learn to pause, learn to appreciate those pauses and and use them to your advantage. So we're almost to the end of 2024. What's the one thing you're determined to achieve for the rest of the year? And what's your moonshot goal for 2025? So my achievement for 2024, what is, what is left, it's actually a non-work goal, but uh, I am studying Portuguese right now. And so every day I have two hours of intensive immersive language lessons and I have a test, an official like state run language test that I am taking in about two and a half weeks. And um, I would like to pass it. Uh, I think I can pass it, but uh Let's just say uh, Portuguese is a really difficult language to learn. And that is, that is on my list through the end of the year. That's the, the big thing. Um, obviously, I have my work and practice and all of that is going well. And I am committed to that. But I think if you're asking about like, what's that one accomplishment that really sticks out? That's, that's what's left. And then it's interesting. Moonshot for 2025. Um, what's interesting about it is I often think in terms of uh, like what, what processes or projects am I starting? And it often looks less like a moonshot and looks a lot more like how am I going to start, start something and work on it in a compounding way to where it starts slow, but it is consistent and it builds into something that is in fact like really big. So a great example of this might be, um, I think I am coming up on having been on a hundred podcasts. So a wonderful group of different hosts and wonderful conversations like yourself. And um, that was not something that, you know, happened instantly, but it was really trying to figure out how to sort of build and create those conversations and build over time. So for 2025, um, I think there are, a couple of different projects, some around content and really sharing my ideas in written form uh, more formally that I'm going to start that compounding process on. Sounds excellent. I think that's a great way to go about it. It doesn't always need to be a moonshot. Pick something that can compound and provide benefits for months and years to come. So what's the best mistake you've ever made that ended up being a complete game changer for you? Sometimes there are things that I don't really see as a mistake that maybe other people <laughs> would say as a mistake. I mean, I think I get asked a lot whether doing an MD PhD, they're like, but you're doing something totally different now. Like, do you regret having done that thing? And in some ways, I can totally see now how um, when I made the pivot into coaching, and and because there were some things about a medical pathway that weren't as good a fit for what I wanted to do. I probably could have seen those coming if I had, you know, really diligently worked at it, like prior to going into medical school, except I, I liked medical school and I actually liked the whole process of all the training that I did. And it turns out that um, a lot of medical training was how to have conversations about high stakes decisions with people. And it turns out coaching high performers has a lot of conversations with them about how to make high stakes decisions about things that matter to them. Um, so it's this funny thing where I did not take perhaps the most direct path to becoming an elite executive coach and coaching around performance. There were other ways that might have seemed more sensical, but in fact, 
like even the science training I got was this wonderful exercise in showing up to the lab every day and you show up to uncertainty. No one tells you what to do. In fact, the whole reason you have a job is because like someone doesn't know the answer. No one knows the answer and it's your job to run experiments and figure it out. And so there were all these elements of like going to medical school, doing the whole medical training, getting a PhD that actually to me fed directly into this work I was doing now. It's just, they were very orthogonal and many people wouldn't see that connection, but I think I got some of the best training there is to do what I want to do now. It's just many people would not have connected those dots. And so for me, um, the reason maybe that mistake turned to gold is because I could see how the dots connected. I could see that thread in my career that gave me all the skills that I needed. And then I was going to go use them in a really different way. And so I think that that's my, that's my mistake turned to gold. Well, it definitely sounds like it turned to gold. If, uh, if Steve jobs hadn't seen what he saw in the iPhone and smartphones, we'd all still be texting on flip phones. So, so there's, there's definitely advantages to seeing, to not, to not necessarily following the path that everyone thinks is the path that should be laid out for you. And you are no stranger to high stress situations after med school and working with the clients you work with. How do you stay calm when adversity hits? What's your advice for leading under pressure when the stakes are high? So I think there are two ways to approach this. The first is how do you want to be preparing all the time? And then there's, what do you do in the moment? So in terms of just making, making yourself sort of at a base level resilient, I think there are a few things that are really important. One is actually around sleep. That sleep is one of the best things we can do for our brains, um, both in the near term, but also like as we age. And, um, we know that when we're underslept, we are in a more fight and flight mode. We are more reactive. We are less creative. And I learned all of these things firsthand when I was a resident <laughs> and getting like four hours of sleep a night. So um, one of the things we can do is we can think about sleep. Um, I think another thing that we can do to prepare our baseline resiliency as a leader is um, to be... Building, building trust and practicing our communication with our teams. So if we have good communication and good trust with our teams, when things are kind of going okay or normal, that just helps us when acute moments hit to be able to move faster, do things that are difficult. Um, but in those moments, we are better prepared. Um, I think some other things like thinking time, planning time for yourself to think. It's possible when stuff gets really stressful, you will not have time to think. But when we have prepared and we come from a place of periodically spending time thinking, our brains are actually primed to be better able to react even if we have to do so quickly. So those are just like a couple of things you could think about to sort of prepare yourself for stressful times. And then when you are like acutely in stress, I think there are a few things that really help. And these are actually like five minute, five minute practices. <laughs> um, and here are three ideas. One is to take a time out, take five minutes to just breathe. Um, I think as, as we pointed out, we sometimes will literally stop breathing when we're looking at our computers. <laughs> and so it is worthwhile. We can absolutely calm our physiology if we spend some time just focusing on our breath even for five minutes. I also think taking a walk outside for five minutes um, does a number of good things for us. Um, number one, gets our blood, blood moving. Number two, we get some endorphins from that. We get more oxygen than we typically get inside. And um, we also get temperature difference, which is very good for our physiology. Um, a third thing we can do to help manage the stress is to remind ourselves why our stress matters and that we have the stress because of something important that we're doing that matters to ourselves or matters to others. And when we can put some meaning to why we're going through this challenging or uncomfortable time, it actually can help 
the stress we feel have a different impact on our bodies. So um, there's a great book I also recommend called The Upside of Stress, which is by Kelly McGonigal. And um, she talks about all the different science around stress and about the importance of what our mindset is about the stress. And, um, and so again, taking, I call this like a mindset moment to reset your mindset about, Hey, why am I going through this? Yes, it's uncomfortable and stressful, but if there's a good purpose behind it, um, it will help change what's actually happening in our bodies. Well, I love the idea of thinking about the, ups the upside of stress and keeping that in mind and those great five minute or less things that we can do to, to reduce our stress. So what is stressing you out? What's keeping you up at night? What's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? And how are you tackling it? So it's, it's interesting. I, one of the things that I'm continually practicing is when things are uncertain to be curious about them and also to approach them with a mindset of like, well, what's the, what's the experiment I could run? Uh, or asking the question, well, is this thing stressing? Why is this thing stressing me out? Right. Is it uncertainty about the outcome? Is it, you know, that I'm taking responsibility for something that I don't need to take responsibility for that I don't actually control? Um, you know, is it, I'm really attached to a particular outcome, but I could just be curious about what happens and then know I can make next steps. So um, I, I am trying to shift some of my mindset around stress, but there are certainly things that I'm working really hard on. Um, one great example is probably for the past three years, I've been um, doing physical therapy for like a knee, a knee that was hurting. And um, I'm a very athletic person. I love exercise and outdoor activities. And, um, you know, I would say if you asked me, what is one of the biggest things that takes some mind share for me, um, that, you know, that ability to run a slow, but steady improvement process to come back from that, um, has been, not, not the best moments of the past few years, but um, I think also really teaches me and reminds me what it looks like to do something hard where you're climbing the mountain and it's really slow, but you make good progress, but you can't rush it. Um, and so in some ways it's good meditation for me as well. I love it. I love it. So looking ahead, what's the one thing you're most excited about for the future of work? I feel like I have an excitement and a fear. <laughs> they are two sides of the same coin. Uh, in the future of work, I believe that AI is going to bring uh, incredible changes. And uh, this is where it's like both an excitement and I think some people have a fear about it, but it will increase our capabilities as human beings. Um, in terms of a number of different things. And what's exciting about that is if we can learn to use the tool and think critically about the tool and know what are the limitations of the tool and, but also what is the power of the tool? It, it's like being able to go into an infinite library and like create and find things. Um, and so, in one hand, I think it can really expand our brains because we, in order to access the full power of it, we have to think really creatively about what are the prompts? How do you set up AI to be able to do what we want it to be able to do? And I think that is very exciting because no longer is it like, well, I have to manually do something and my effort is around the manual doing of something. But now it's like, how can you ask the right questions and get access to the information that's most important. How can you test that information to make sure it's good or right? I think that's very exciting. I think the fear or the challenge of this is it's also possible that AI makes us lazy and that instead of thinking of it as a chance for our brains to think way more creatively about the prompts we give, how we use the tool and how the tool expands our capabilities, which actually takes a lot of critical thinking. My fear is that because 
you can just ask a question and an answer comes back that we will actually stop thinking as critically. And I suspect we will see some of both of these things in the future. And it will be interesting to see the tide as people learn to use the tool and having AI as a tool as it changes some of the competitive dynamics in the world. So that's, uh, that's what I think about the future of work. Yeah, no doubt. Every, every technology comes with its pros and its cons and its upsides and its downsides. So I'm sure we'll see a lot of that. So before we go, for future leaders aiming for high performance, what's your best piece of advice for them to get to the next level? My best piece of advice would be generally those people are already working very hard. They're putting in a lot of effort. So my advice would actually be that they block some time and take some time to think about what, what would be the different or the orthogonal thing that would improve what they're doing. So sometimes that is um, a different synergistic skill. Sometimes it's leveling up a weakness. Um, sometimes that's uh, heading in a different direction. Sometimes it is just figuring out how to scale up and do way more of what you're already doing. But I, I think we actually have to take some time to stop and think both about what we want to achieve, but also what's going to be most important to get me there versus just, well, I just continue doing what I'm doing and hopefully it gets me there. So taking some time to think and then learn uh, is, is my advice. Yeah, it's the one of the hardest things we found in the military for mid-level leaders to to step up and become great strategic thinking senior leaders to start thinking differently and think about what's the best thing to do, not how have I done it in the past. Uh, I think that's a great place to leave it. Uh, tell everyone where they can find you. So great places to connect with me. Um, one is my website, which is at thaxa.com. That's T-H-A-X-A. And that's a great place if you're interested in learning more about coaching. I have a good FAQ section, and I also have a list of various podcast interviews I've done. If you're just interested in geeking out on performance science, uh, that's a great place to go. But I also am sharing new thoughts and content on LinkedIn, and I'm at Carla-Fowler. So that's a great place to follow along as well. Yeah. And we'll put all that in the episode description so people can just click the links and not have to type all that in. So Carla, thanks so much for your incredible insights today. To everyone watching, if you found this conversation valuable, go ahead and share it, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Please thank Carla for being here today and joining us if you liked what she had to say. We've got more powerful interviews with leaders coming your way. So keep watching, keep developing your leader's mindset onward and upward.